Chapter 18, The Stimulating Effects of Tea, Part 2 The voyage of the Ark and the Dove was spiritually directed by a Jesuit priest named Andrew White. Educated at both Santo Omers and Douai, a professor for twenty years in Portugal, Spain, and Flanders, Andrew White is remembered by the Church as the Apostle to Maryland. Choosing an Andrew for the task was good liturgical cabala on the part of the Jesu. Andrew was the brother of the Apostle Peter, the first Pope, the rock upon whom Roman Catholicism claims to be established. Andrew is the patron saint of Scotland. King Charles I was a Scot, a personal representative of the king's brotherly attitude towards Rome could not be more eloquently identified than by the simple name Andrew. Andrew White consecrated the Maryland voyage to two Catholic saints, the Virgin Mary, protectress of the Jesuits, and Ignatius Loyola, only recently decreed patron saint of Maryland by Urban the Eighth, the second pupil of Jesuits to be elected Pope. The ships were at sea nearly four months. Finally, 123 days from England, on March 25, 1634, the parties reached St. Clement's Island in the mouth of the Potomac River. It was an auspicious day. Not only was March 25th the first day of spring, but also it was the first day of the Julian calendar. In 1752, the colonies would adopt the Gregorian calendar, which we follow today. On March 25th, Andrew White reached the first Rome pre read the first Roman Mass ever held in any of the original thirteen colonies. Then he formally took possession of the land for our Savior and for our Sovereign Lord King of England. Maryland historians trace the juridical origins of Roman Catholic Church in the United States to a Patuxent Indian chieftain wig chieftain's wigwam, which Andrew White denoted in his diary, the First Chapel of Maryland. White introduced Roman Catholicism to the Patuxtans, the Anacostics, and Piscataways on real estate that today comprises the District of Columbia. It's quite probable that the District of Columbia's executive mansion was termed White House less because of a color of exterior paint than out of reverence for the Apostle to Maryland. Every utterance of White House should fill the historically knowledgeable Jesuit with pride in his society's achievements. Conversions among the Indians ran high, but the society enjoyed greater profits evangelizing Protestants. For every Protestant settler, converted, the Jesuit won a land grant from Cecilius Calvert. Other lands Calvert retained and passed on to his descendants. Over the generations, Rock Creek Farm, with its Rome, on which the U.S. Capitol was erected, devolved to the Calvert heiress Eleanor Darnell and her husband, an Irish immigrant whose marriage and abilities had earned enough money to make him a prosperous merchant planter. It was to this couple, and on this land, that the first American bishop was born in 1735. Like his older brother Daniel, Jackie Carroll did his earliest schooling at Bohemian Manor, a secret Jesuit academy just down the road. Bohemia Manor had to be run secretly because of anti-Catholic laws resulting from the abdication of Catholic James II and the succession of Protestants William and Mary to the British throne in 1689. The penal period in Maryland, which would extend up to the American Revolution, served the black, the black papacy well by inclining affluent Catholic families to send their sons across the Atlantic to take the Jesuit Ratio Studiorum at St. Omer's. Indeed, more Americans went to St. Omer's College in the 18th century than to Oxford and Cambridge combined. 
At the tender age of thirteen, Jackie sailed to Europe with his even younger cousin, Charles Carroll, for schooling at St. Omer's. Daniel returned home from there to help manage the family interests he stood to inherit. In 1753, Jackie entered the novitiate of the Jesuits at Watton in the Netherlands. Charles went on to study pre-law at Voltaire's alma mater, the Collège Louis Le Grand, in Paris. In 1758, Jackie returned to saint Omer's to teach, while, Char- while Charles crossed the Channel to England, enrolling in London's premier school for barristers, the Inner Temple, founded in the 14th century by the Knights Templar. Jackie was ordained to the Jesuit priesthood in 1761, when he learned that St. Omer's was about to be seized by the French government in preparation for the royal edict suppressing the Jesuits in France. He, with other teachers and their pupils, moved to Bruges. In 1769, he renounced his Calvert inheritance, sloughed off his nickname, took the extreme Jesuit vow of papal obedience, and began teaching philosophy and theology at the English College at Liege. It was here that he befriended Charles Philippe Storton, his grand tour companion. John Carroll's arrival at his mother's home in Maryland coincided with Paul Revere's ride to Philadelphia bearing letters from the Boston Committee of Correspondence seeking aid from Charles Thompson's group in protesting the closing of Boston Harbor. From his mother's estate at Rock Creek, Carroll dealt with the aftermath of the Tea Act by exercising his secularized priestly authority as prefect of the sodality. He integrated the Catholics of Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Northern Virginia into the movement for independence. Charles Thompson's Philadelphia Committee sent Boston a letter of support. The committee additionally proposed a Congress of Deputies from the colonies to a. consider measures to restore harmony with Great Britain, and b. prevent the dispute from advancing to an undesirable end. Thompson then notified all the colonies of Pennsylvania of his committee's action. He suggested the necessity of calling a general congress to consider the problem. Combined with a similar call from the Virginia House of Burgesses, his suggestion was approved throughout the colonies. Plans were laid for the first Continental Congress to meet at Philadelphia in September. On June 1, 1774, the bill closing Boston Harbor went into effect. Thompson's radicals led Philadelphia in observing a day of mourning. Shops closed, churches held services, the people remained quietly in their homes. On June 8, Thompson and more than 900 freeholders petitioned Governor Richard Penn to convene the Pennsylvania Assembly so that it might consider sending delegates to an all-colony Congress to explore ways of restoring harmony and peace to the British Empire. The governor refused their request, which justified Thompson's taking action outside the established order. Thompson called for a town meeting to be held on June 18th, Nearly 8,000 Philadelphians attended. Boisterously, they resolved that the closing of Boston Harbor was tyrannical and that a Continental Congress to secure the rights and liberties of the colonies must be convened in Philadelphia. In July, the Pennsylvania Assembly yielded to Thompson's popular pressure and agreed to name a delegation to the First Continental Congress. Thompson, however, was not named. Thanks to the publicity from his first citizen, second citizen media production during the first half of 1773, Charles Carroll was named by the Annapolis Committee of Correspondence to be a delegate to the First Continental Congress. But he declined the nomination. He said that his usefulness might be restricted by his an- by anti-Catholic sentiment engendered by the Quebec Act, with which Parliament had avenged the Boston Tea Party by giving the western lands of Massachusetts, Connecticut, Virginia, and New York to Catholic Quebec. He attended the Congress, however, but as an unofficial consultant to the Marylanders. 
Charles Thompson accompanied the Pennsylvanias in the same capacity. To prepare for the September 5th opening session, delegates began arriving in Philadelphia in late August. They congregated at a well-known radical meeting place, the elegant mansion of Thomas Mifflin. Mifflin had studied classics under Charles Thompson at Benjamin Franklin's Academy, later to become University University of Pennsylvania. They were close friends. As Mifflin's house guest, Thompson was on hand, round the clock, to greet and confer with the arriving leaders, most of whom already knew him by name. John Adams' diary entry for August 30th speaks of much conversation he and his fellow delegates had with the learned Thompson. He called Thompson the Sam Adams of Philadelphia and the life of the cause of liberty. Thompson and the Carols Charles, Daniel, and John spent these critical preliminary days lobbying for the inevitability of war. Thompson was already heavily invested in New Jersey, New Jersey's Batso furnace. Batso would furnish cannonballs, shot, kettles, spikes, and nails to the army through the war commissioner, who controlled all the executive duties of the military department. The war commissioner was just the man Lorenzo Ricci needed for the job, Charles Carroll. Thompson was elected secretary of the First Continental Congress, an office he held under the title Perpetual Secretary until the United States Constitution was ratified in 1789. He led the delegates through an itemized statement of the American theory of rebellion, that culminated in the critical declaration and resolves of October 14, 1774. It was while the First Continental Congress was deliberating America's future under British tyranny that Ganganelli, Pope Clement XIV, died his agonizing death September 22, 1774. When the papacy is vacant, says the New Catholic Encyclopedia, the administration and guardianship of the Holy See's temporal rights, that is, its business affairs, are routinely taken over by the treasurer of the apostolic chamber. The apostolic treasurer on the day of Ganganelli's passing was Cardinal Giovanni Brasci, a 57-year-old aristocrat of impoverished parentage. Cardinal Brasci was a sterling product of the Jesuit colleges. The Ratio Studiorum had made of him a distinguished lawyer and diplomat. He had been apostolic treasurer when Rothschild began serving in the Catholic Principality of Hess Hanover in 1769. This interesting fact awakens the possibility that the Cardinal and Rothschild had been involved in Ricci's American project for years. But that is only conjecture. What is beyond conjecture, however, is that until a new pope could be elected, the whole fiscal wealth of the Roman Catholic Church belonged to Brasci and no one else. Although lacking formal entitlement, Cardinal Brasci would rule as a kind of virtual pontif- pontifex maximus for one of the longest periods of papal vacancy on record. Day after day the conclave haggled over a single issue— What would the candidates do about the Jesuits? Should Ganganelli's brief of disestablishment continue to be enforced or not? Although Lorenzo Ricci was in detention at Castle St. Angelo, we know he could easily hop a tunnel carriage to the Vatican for covert meetings with the virtual Pope. In a very real real way, Brasci was a creation of Ricci's, Brasci had been made a cardinal under the sponsorship of Ganganelli, whose own cardinalate was sponsored by, as we recall, Ricci. These two most powerful men on earth, Ricci and Brasci, had been secretly allied for years, and now the turn of events had made them invisible and inaudible. These last precious days in the final bursting forth of Ricci's grand strategy afforded ideal conditions for Brasci and Ricci to determine face-to-face with the Rothschild emissaries, out of public sight and mind, 
how the Vatican's immense resources, money, men, supplies, would be deployed in the coming months and years. In October 1774, for example, colonial agent Benjamin Franklin sent England's most enlightened copy copywriter, Tom Paine, to beef up the pamphleteers in Philadelphia. The days of papal vacancy wore on, 30, 50, 60, 75, 100 days, 110. Finally, after nearly five months of confusion, on February 15, 1775, the 134th day, it was announced that Rome had a new pope. The new pope was a man acceptable to both sides of the Jesuit question. He had tacitly assured the anti-Jesuits that he would continue to enforce disestablishment, yet the pro-Jesuits knew he would enforce it tenderly because of the great intellectual, political, and spiritual debts he owed the society. The new pope was best qualified for the papacy's for the papacy because he'd been running the Holy See with Lorenzo Ricci for the past 134 days. Giovanni Brasci. Brasci took the papal name Pius VI. And now plummeted the great avalanche. On February 9, 1775, the British Parliament declared Massachusetts to be in a state of rebellion. On March 23rd, Patrick Henry delivered his famous Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death oration. On April 19th, at a tense daybreak confrontation on Lexington Green between a group of angry colonists and some 800 redcoats, an unseen and unidentified shootist fired on the redcoats from behind a nearby meeting house. This was the shot heard round the world although Ralph Waldo Emerson coined that phrase in his Concord Hymn, 1836, to describe a skirmish at Concord Bridge, seven miles away and a few hours later. The air on Lexington Green crackled with exploding gunpowder, and when the smoke cleared, eight colonists lay dead. As the Redcoats returned to Boston, they were attacked by ever-increasing colonial militiamen. The Massachusetts Provincial Congress mobilized 13,600 colonial soldiers and placed Boston under a siege that lasted for almost a year. To prevent the spread of the Boston carnage to the Quaker province, the Pennsylvania Assembly named Charles Thompson and 12 others to a committee to purchase explosives and munitions, the leading manufacturers of which happened to be Thompson and Charles Carroll. On May 10th, the Second Continental Congress convened in Philadelphia and named George Washington Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army. On June 22nd, Congress voted to issue a continental currency, $2 million in unsecured bills of credit to be used in paying the costs of war. On July 3rd, George Washington formally assumed command of the Continental Army. About 17,000 men gathered in Cambridge, Massachusetts. On July 5th, Congress adopted its last humble plea for peace with England, the Olive Branch Petition, written by Charles Thompson and John Dickinson. Governor Penn of Pennsylvania personally delivered the petition to London, but the King's friends prevented George III from seeing Penn or even acknowledging the petition. On July 6th, Congress adopted the Declaration of the Causes, and necessities of taking up arms, which fell short of asserting independence, but vowed a holy war of liberation from slavery. On August 23rd, George III issued a proclamation declaring that all 13 American colonies were in a state of open rebellion. Two months later in October, British forces burned Falmouth, which is presently Portland, Maine. The war was on. But from Lorenzo Ricci's vantage point, the war was won. There remained only opportunities now for his enemies, 
the British Crown and the American Colonials to engage in bloodletting hostilities that would eventually separate and exhaust them both. Divide et impera, divide and conquer, what to the British was the War of American Rebellion, and to the Americans the War for Independence, was to General Ricci the War for the war of reunification with Protestant dissidents. From it would rise the first Febronian government on earth, a constellation of secular churches called states, led by an elaborate electorate of laymen, properly enlightened by the Ratio Studiorum, and united under the spiritual guidance of Pontifex Maximus, and paying tribute to Rome for the privilege. United States. The real war over, there began now the unraveling, which was the historical war, the theatrical war. This would consist of a series of bloody battles mounted by Congress and Crown for the people's participation, observation, and commemoration. These events would produce Caesarian Rome's essential emotional cornerstone. Like Virgil's Aeneid, epic national heroes would forge a fictitious national legacy. We must not forget Charles Thompson's candid assessment of the revo- that the revolution's leaders were largely deceptions, men of supposed wisdom and valor who were far inferior to the qualities that have been ascribed to them. There is evidence, admittedly the faintest hint of evidence, as is so often the case with clandestine warriors, that Lorenzo Ricci communed with these American heroes and gave them instruction on their own soil. This evidence is present- presented in our next chapter. <laughs>